Hello, and welcome to my session, Developing Applications for iOS Using Delphi XD2 and FireMonkey. My name is Anders Olsen. I'm a staff engineer here at Embarcadero Technologies in uh, Scotts Valley. Uh, you can see links to my blog and my email here, blogs.embarcadero.com slash AO, or aolson at embarcadero.com. That's A-O-H-L-S-S-O-N at embarcadero.com. And today we're going to talk about iOS development. This is actually my only slide, so uh, the rest of this will be uh, demonstrations. Let me just show you um, a little bit what I've done in the past here. Um, I'm going to fall back on um, probably mentioning a bunch of uh, the iOS blogs that I've done in the past. Uh, specifically, what we're going to take a look at today is um, the DataSnap client for iOS using Interbase. Um, this in the past required a lot of uh, custom work uh, for each individual server, but since we now have a new um, Free Pascal uh, DataSnap mobile connector for iOS, it is much, much simpler, and we'll see that today. So here's uh, all my uh, past blogs that I have. Uh, we have multiple components. I've got about 10 components in Code Central that you can take a look at. For uh, the newest one is handling swipe gestures in FireMonkey as well. All right, so enough of my blog, and let's actually get into uh, the IDE here. So let's start with um, a very, very simple project, uh, just to show you what you can do using FireMonkey uh, for iOS. So we'll start off with uh, with this guy here, uh, we'll drop down a uh, image control. Make it a little bigger, and we'll go ahead and find a bitmap. Let's say the uh, let's say the speedometer that I found earlier. So let's go ahead and add some uh, effects to this. So we have a reflection effect. Let's do a reflection effect here on on the image. So here we see the default is that it reflects um, about half uh, of the image. You can make it a little smaller here. Okay. We can also um, do animations. So an animation on a reflection could be, for instance, um, let's say we uh, start at point 1 and we want to go all the way to 1 as far as the length of the reflection. Instead of setting that manually, we can add uh, a um, what's called a float animation. Let's say it's going to take two seconds to animate. Uh, we're going to auto-reverse auto it. We're going to enable it, of course. And we're going to animate from point 1 to 1 1.0 and we're going to loop uh, that as well. So if we just run this and test it on Win32, uh, this is what it's going to look like. So it takes one second to, uh, two seconds to go all the way, two seconds to go all the way back. All right, we can add multiple animations at the same time. So let's see, we wanted to animate the opacity as well. So the reflection effect is by default 50% opacity. If it was 100%, it would look uh, like this, and if it was zero, then it would disappear, right? So in this case, we add a new float animation. Um, we auto reverse that as well. Uh, we go from, uh, let's say, two seconds here as well, or maybe four seconds. So it takes uh, twice as long. We enable it, uh, we loop it, and we'll go from zero to one. So if we run that now, we get a fading um, reflection effect. Finally, what we can do is uh, just add one more animation, and that could be the rotation angle, for instance, of uh, this guy. So we're going to go from 360 to, uh, from 0 to 360, we're going to loop that we're not going to order reverse it because we're not going to go back. We're just going to go around in a circle. Let's make that take 10 seconds. And we enable that as well. And of course, when we run it, we will have 
Now it was spinning a speedometer with a pulsating uh, reflection effect. So now let's put this on the iPhone. So let's go save it. I'm going to save it in my shared directory here. And we'll put it in here. Uh, overwrite what was there before. Yes. Replace it. Replace it. Yes. And we go ahead and uh, run dpr to xcode once we run dpr to xcode we can now go over to xcode and open up the project in xcode and run it on the simulator so now when we run it on the simulator so clean just for fun and then we run it on the simulator and it should pop up on the simulator and do exactly what it did on the win32 side so here's my iPhone uh, simulator with a rotating uh, speed dial or speedometer and a, a reflection effect that's uh, pulsating both in opacity and uh, length. The next application we're going to do is, um, is an analog clock. Uh, let's just create an analog clock. Uh, and you'll see it's very, uh, it's really pretty simple in uh, FireMonkey to uh, to do these things. So let's start with um, we we'll start with the T circle. That's going to be our uh, our base for our clock. Uh, let's put it at 10. Uh, let's make it 300 uh, high, uh, 300 wide, and we're going to put it at. Um, 10, 10, right? So at the top. Okay, so that's our this is our clock face. Now inside of here, uh, we're going to put the uh, the dials. So we name this clock like that. <coughs> we'll put another uh, another circle for the hour hand. So this is going to be now the base of rotation for my hour hand going to put a circle in the middle. I'm going to make it um, uh, black and it's going to be located in the center. The position is going to be 140, 140 and it's going to be inside of the clock and now it's centered. Uh, we're going to name it, call it our hand. Okay, so inside of the this um, circle that I'm going to use as the basis of rotation uh, for the hour hand, I'm going to put a rectangle and very simply create uh, a dial or or an hour hand, if you will. So here's my uh, color. I'm going to make it black. I'm going to make it uh, ten high and. Uh, uh, sorry, 10 high and 90, 10 wide and 90 high, like that. And the position is all that needs to be changed now. So we're going to put it at 5 and minus 60. And of course, it needs to go inside of the circle of the hour hand. There we go. There's the minus 60. Okay, so that's our hour hand. Now we're going to put a second hand, uh, or a minute hand. So same thing, 20 by 20. Uh, name it minute hand. Uh, we put it inside of the clock uh, for our uh, composite control. Uh, we position it. at uh, 140, uh, 140, just like the other one. We make it black, like so. And then inside of that, we need to put another rectangle. Right 
here. We're going to make this one 130 high. And the width will be 8. The position will be 6 and minus 100. And of course it needs to go inside of the minute hand. So now you're seeing where I'm going with this. Oh, this one disappeared again. Minus 100. Okay, and the color is black. Okay, so now we have a hour hand that's fat and a minute hand that's a little thinner. And then finally, of course, we're going to add the thinnest of them all, which is the uh, second second hand. So the second hand is going to be red. It's going to be 20 by 20. The position is still going to be 140 by 140 because that's the center of the circle. Assuming that we put it on the clock face. And finally we name it. Uh, name is right here, second hand. Okay, and then we put on the final rectangle, which will be red, and it will be 150 high. It will be sitting at 2020, and it will be. Um, Four wide, and we drop it onto the second hand. Oh, slightly off. Let's see what happened. Uh, oh, there we go. Eight is the X position. Okay, so now we have uh, our minute and second hands. All we need to do now uh, to make this a functional clock is to drop down a T timer right here. Uh, let's say we want to update it. Uh, we could do once a second, but let's do one, um, you know, every four times a second, just for uh, so we don't miss anything, so it doesn't get uh, jumpy on us <coughs> in case we miss uh, uh, miss a little bit. So on the timer, uh, we're simply going to declare a couple of variables. We're going to have hour, minute, uh, second, and millisecond. So are going to be words. Uh, we do a decode date time. Oh, sorry, decode uh, time. And we pass in now, which is the current uh, date and time. We pass in hour, minute, second, and millisecond. So out of this comes the individual hour, minute, and second, and millisecond values. And then all we need to do now is our hand dot rotation angle colon equals and uh, we realize that uh, there's 360 degrees so we divide by 12 so that's uh, 30 so it's 30 degrees per hour the hour hand would be very um, jumpy if we only took into account the hour because it would jump 30 degrees all of a sudden when the hour gets a new value. So what we do is we add in minutes and divide by 60 as well. So it moves 60 times per hour, uh, once a minute. Uh, and then all we need to do for a minute hand is very much the same thing. Uh, in this case, for simplicity, uh, six times uh, the number of minutes because there's 60 minutes to um, an hour therefore there's six degrees per minute uh, same thing with second hand rotation angle colon equals six times second and this is all we should need so we can try this on uh, Win32 and see what happens So here's my uh, Win32 clock. You notice it was uh, catching up there for a while. Uh, you can see that it is uh, 1246 here in Scotts Valley.
Okay, so we close that down. And uh, what's missing? Uh, you know, the last touch would be to actually have a clock face. So I actually have a clock face. So if I click on the clock, go to my fill, and grab a bitmap. I load a bitmap, and I just have one on the desktop, which I generated uh, in advance. I have a Roman number, uh, Roman numbers uh, dots two, a ping file. So here you can see that it's a big clock face with Roman numerals. Hit OK. Uh, it's actually transparent, so once we uh, flip this over to uh, BK bitmap, we'll see a uh, clock face here. We're going to change this from tile to uh, uh, stretch, and there is our clock face. So now we can run it again, and it looks much nicer, right? Looks like a real clock. Let's uh, change the background here of the uh, of the form uh, to be white, so we can see the clock a little clearer. Okay, so there's a clock. We'll go ahead and save this project. I'm going to save it in the same spot we had before, which was. Um, uh, March 7 webinar. I'm going to save it right here. Overwrite it. Click yes. Save it. Click yes. And run DPR text code on that and go back to the Macintosh side and open up uh, the project in Xcode uh, and see what it looks like. So let's do a clean again and we run it on the simulator and see what it looks like. And there's my clock on the uh, iPhone. And um, like I said, it's uh, four lines of code. Of course, if we wanted to make it uh, uh, like a Rolex and make it smooth drive, then we would uh, have a lot more steps uh, per uh, second as well. So doing that is uh, simply a matter of going back to uh, to Delphi, changing the uh, event a little bit, and in here we're going to say the same thing we do for the hour hand. We'll take into account uh, the seconds, and for the second hand we'll take into account the milliseconds as well. And there it is on the Win32 side. Of course, if we wanted even smoother steps now, we would change the timer uh, to be maybe 50 milliseconds. And now we'd get much, much smoother. On the uh, second hand, the minute hand is also moving. It's very hard to see, though. Okay, so we can save that. We do uh, go back to Xcode. And Xcode is a little picky, so let's uh, reopen the project. And we pick uh, iPhone, and we do a clean again, and we run the project. And we should see the same smooth clock on my iPhone. And there it is. Much, much smoother uh, than it was before. Okay, so that ends the simple UI uh, stuff that we're doing in this session and we're going to go back and take a look at how we can talk to a data snap server. So for that I have an existing uh, data snap group here. This is my client. The data snap server if we take a look at it uh, looks like this. Uh, bare bones uh, data snap server that is created to uh, with uh, mobile connector uh, support. We have server methods. I have a uh, database that goes to interbase and a, and a data set which is just a CT table. Um, <clears throat> and then we have server methods in here. My server methods are uh, get record count, get a specific record by record number and get the parameters back uh, first name and last name, or get records as a tjson array. 
the get record count simply opens the data set, gets the record count, and closes the data set again. The get record is a fairly dumb method. You would not necessarily do this ever. Um, you open the data set and we step through to find the correct record number. Uh, we then get the first name and the last name and return that as the output parameters and we close the data set. Finally, get records, which is the one that we should be using. Um, this creates a tjson array. Uh, we open the data set and we go ahead and create the uh, entries in the or elements in the tjson array. So my object here is going to be a tjson object. To that I'm going to add two pairs. Last name is the name and the value of the actual last name field in the employee database is the value. Okay, First name and f the value of the first name column is uh, the second pair. We add that element to the array and we go to the next record and over and over uh, and add all uh, records that are in here. Finally we close it and we re uh, return the result. Okay, so the way we can test this uh, just on, on the Win32 side here is simply rerun it and up comes the uh, DataSnap server right here. So it's running on port 8080. We can start it. We can open the browser. We can take a look at server functions drill into tServer methods and we see get record count, get record, and get records. Get record count, when I execute it, will return the number of records in the data set, which is 42 right here. Get record, I can specify a value. Maybe I want to get the first one, record 0. Okay, that happens to be Robert Nelson. Um, what about the last record? Okay, 41 is uh, Mark Guckenheimer. Okay. So then when we click on Get Records, Get Records doesn't take any input value because it returns all of the records. We hit Execute, and we get the entire data set back. Notice uh, Robert Nelson is the first one, and Mark Guckenheimer is the last record. This is all one uh, big um, JSON uh, result. So now we can go ahead and start looking at a client. Now, if we go to um, the same, we go back to the data snap server and we put in a link here after which is called proxy. And specifically, what we are looking for is the free Pascal um, iOS 5.0 proxy. So when we click on this, we get a zip file. So we can open that and see what we get. So this is the data snap proxy for this particular data snap server. So here we have uh, DS proxy, that's the main one. We also have um, DS rest connection that we're going to use. And in fact, in our particular demo, we're also going to use DBX FPC JSON, which gives me the, the, uh, the type declaration for um, TJSON array on the Free Pascal side. So remember, this is all Free Pascal. So what we're going to do now is go ahead and uh, I've already saved this in the client project. So I'll leave this running, and we'll go take a look at now the client. So my client is right here. Here's my client. I have uh, edit boxes for the host IP and the port, and then a button to get uh, some data uh, from the DataSnap server. When I click on the uh, on the button, it will simply uh, create a uh, data snap rest connection. I will uh, put in the host and the port uh, from the edit boxes. 
So the host is actually a string and the port is a number, so I convert that to a, an integer. The protocol is HTTP. And then we create the proxy, uh, tServer methods one. tServer methods one, if we go take a look at it, is located in that DS proxy unit that we downloaded from the DataSnap server. Okay, so it's declared as follows. We have a tServer methods, and then all the stuff that we need to pay attention to is get record count, get record, and get records. That's exactly what we declared on the server side, and those are the um, methods that we're going to be using. And, and we don't really need to uh, dig into all this um, pre-Pascal specific stuff uh, at all. All we need to, to, uh, to worry about are the, uh, these three methods that we're not going to be using. So if we keep going here, uh, what I do is I clean, um, I clear the uh, memo. I keep track of when I started so that I can get a total runtime uh, execution time. I start by using the simple method, which is get record. So in this case, I get the record count. That's going to be my 42. I'm going to loop from 0 to 41 and get, uh, for each one, I'm going to get the record and get back first name and last name and add it to the memo, first name and last name. So let's make a simple mistake here. We run it on the Win32 side. <clears throat> when we run it on the Win32 side, we're going to get an exception saying that this proxy can only be used on Delph, uh, on uh, Free Pascal on iOS, not on Delphi for Windows. Okay, so we save that. Uh, we go ahead and do uh, DPR to Xcode, and we go back on the Macintosh side to Xcode, and we tell it to open our client project. Uh, we do a clean, and we run it. So now that I run it, it's going to build a client, um, pop it up in the simulator, and show me the Data snap client, okay. So we're going to get the data from the uh, from the data snap server, and we notice here. Okay, it took a second. We can do it again. This time it took 884 milliseconds, and that's usually where it stabilizes in this case. Okay, so it takes roughly um, 0.9 to uh, one second in this particular demo. So now we go back, and what we're going to do now, of course, is to not use the slow method. We're going to use the faster method. The faster method will, in one fell swoop, call get records. This retrieves the entire data set as a tJSON array. And of course, the tJSON array can contain just about anything. Um, Normally, you'd probably use a TDBX uh, reader if you uh, were using a Delphi client and a Delphi um, server. But you know, if you want to do something that's cross-platform, you use it for multiple clients. You should uh, you should use uh, standard types um, that you can use in any language. And uh, tJSON array is a pretty good one. So in this case, um, we loop from zero to array size minus one and uh, we retrieve the J uh, JSON object, index i. That will be a tJSON object. tJSON object has a method um, that you can get one of the pairs. In this case, we're going to get the last name pair. We're going to take the value. We're going to turn it into a string. So this is going to be the last name of the first record. I'm not sure why, but it has uh, two quotation marks uh, beginning at the end. So what I'm doing here is simply trimming off those two and uh, just taking the last name. Same thing for la first name. We get the first name, uh, we trim it, and then we add it to the memo, first name and last name. Finally, we simply put the timestamp, uh, the difference uh, in the execution time at the bottom. So now if we save this and go back to uh, Xcode, and run that again. Let's do a clean and let's do a run. And now we have a different uh, different client 
and much faster. I clicked on it and it returns in 334 milliseconds, somewhere between 300 and 330 milliseconds every time. So this, of course, as expected, is much faster because I'm not making uh, 42 calls. Uh, I'm simply making one, one call, and that's going to be a lot faster. So again, my name is Anders Olson. Uh, you can go to my blog at blogs.embarkator.com slash AO, uh, or you can send me an email at aolson at embarkator.com. Thank you very much for watching.